Jim, thank you for being here, being the first victim, uh, or first honoree. I mentioned that uh, you were born in New Jersey, and, um, but you moved to Brooklyn. What was sort of the, your family like? In terms of, and what impact did that have? How those first See, I, I broke, I, I didn't realize I was breaking a lifelong rule, and it, and, it, and it served me as well as any rule in my life, never go first. I had no idea. <laughs> so this, so this is, this is going to be a disaster. This is, this is, this is some hex. Um, well, look what happened. I was thinking about uh, Black Tuesday, if we're going back to Mary Tyler Moore, where, where you've had disasters oh, before God, that turned that? around. Oh, God, That's amazing right? that you know about that. Yeah. So uh, Friday the thirteenth, we're doing this too. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a double. Well, I'm in a good Mercury's mood probably in retrograde. <laughs> Both my parents were salespeople. Only my father was an alcoholic, um, uh, and uh, not enormously successful. My father sold furniture, and and my mother sold children's clothes. And she sort of held us together. And they was this in New Jersey at first in New before Jersey. moving, yeah. and where have, coming from Montclair and Verona. Well, I North Bergen, which is yeah. directly across the river in Manhattan. Right. I mean, right. the, the R4 floor walk up is, you know, yuppied up pretty good these days. Do you ever go back now? I mean, I, you know, it's, 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 uh, it, this is a true story. I wanted to show um, a woman I was involved with where I came from. So this was seven, eight years ago. And, um, and I, I went back to my old neighborhood that had changed remarkably. But I walked into uh, the only place I recognized was a grocery store called Wrestler's Corner, owned by Mr. Wrestler, who was, and I, I, I hadn't been there uh, I mean, since I was 20, but I don't know if I've been in that store since I was 14. And he, the minute I walked in, he said, Jimmy, this is absolutely mm -hmm. true. And it was his last day, you know, in that store. That, so that last familiar thing was going. And, and he was a pretty, he was the only one who carried us. We had no money and he used to allow my money, my mother to owe and allowed us to charge it and never asked for it until we, we could get it together or my mother could get it together. So he was, I, he was a blessed man in my life and I was able to, to thank him that day and then there was some correspondence afterwards. So literally, you're walking back in there after say 40 years or what, 30 years, whatever it is. And it's his last day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Remarkable. Yeah. When you went to New York, what was the sort of first thing that, that you, you were doing? Or? By that time, I was writing news for a local radio station. Because I wanted to ask you, and I know this And I might have still been a CBS page boy. I think I, think I was. Actually. So that was sort of the, 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 the sort of slipping through the door was as a CBS page well, boy? Well, not slipping through the door. I mean, just amazing that I got through the door. My sister was friends with the secretary to the person who was in charge of the page staff. So I was, you know, I, I had the, the roughest resume of anybody there. They got a lot of college graduates. I had busted out of college after, you know, a year, unfortunately. And, uh, and what institution of lower learning was this? NYU. Yeah, yeah. What everybody's always asked once you get through the door is how does it happen? I believe strongly that you need a break and you need luck and you, and it, and it, you never, just never stop being either the, benefic the beneficiary or the victim of circumstance. But I, you know, in other words, and at the time, though I was reading plays since I was a kid, that was, you know, my pleasure, and and um, and I had taken, you know, writing courses, and I had to survive. You know, I had to have a job, and and there were, you know, I had a lot of different jobs that I didn't do well at, and uh, but this, I through a break. I mean, it's just a series of breaks. It's almost like, you know. I, I've got to avoid too many of the restless corner stories, but here's but here's another one. Um, I was, you know, they, they 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 didn't say two years and out if you were a page, but you started to look a little dusty as others went on, and you did not. <laughs> and I and I was two years there, and uh, there was a chance to be a vacation replacement for a desk assistant at CBS News. You know, CBS News uh, meant quite a bit then. And I was there for two weeks, fumbling around, trying to figure out how to load the machines they used at the time. And the guy I replaced didn't come back. And this was a job where you not only had to go be a college graduate, you had to be, you know, a top student at a great college and a journalism major and maybe had an advanced degree. And I had a high school diploma. And because the kid didn't come back, I got 
that job, and that's just a pure break, and that governed my life for a while. Let me go back for a second. You said you read plays. Like, what plays did you gravitate towards? Well, I was, just, I was just in the library downstairs, and I, and I saw that, you know, I, I asked them to look up Chayefsky and Petty Chayefsky, and, and they said, uh, you know, nine television plays by Patty Chayefsky was one of the books, and I, that was one of the books that I read, you know, just going over that. I remember they had a collection of, damn it, what was the show? Uh, they had a collection of Bilko scripts that I, that in Pocketbook that, that, that I read, and, um, and they used to have Theater Arts Magazine published a play every month, and I'd always read that play, and I'd get collections of plays and always read that. I remember for a long time, Boy Meets Girl was to me the, you know, still a pretty damn funny play and a, and a damn good one, but was just amazing. And, and um, you know, that was it, yeah. In terms of Chayefsky, it seems to me in a way there's a relationship to your work, which is that you have managed to sort of have comedy, but all the, the films certainly have this sort of other level going on. Well, he dabbled in comedy, he, yeah. he, but, but he was, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I still think if, you, if we're going to have a discussion of who's the most underrated writer in, you know, in American history, I, you know, I put him there. Um, uh, ex you know, extraordinary, singular, nobody wrote like him. And, and in terms of the screenplays, I think frustrated in terms of television after the golden age and stuff like that. But in terms of screenplays, I, I don't think there's anyone else who stone cold saw the future. Stone cold saw the future. Uh, it was twice, you know, with, with, with hospital and with network. I mean, it just, you know, nobody was thinking about these things, let alone seeing where it would be a quarter of a century later. You know, maybe in, in sort of, you know, he, the first thing I can think of would be Walt Disney, in, but that would be almost the reverse. He tried to sort of have the <laughs> that, future be okay, his yeah. rather than I see think I have the distinction of being the only one to ever <laughs> use those two names in one sentence. <laughs> But tell me also, one of the things that interested me in just looking at, you know, if you go to IMDb and, and outspills this resume, uh, about the documentaries, about the sort of, I guess, David Wolper period. The truth is about God bless him and God bless it and God bless everybody who came through there because it was a great shop and it was amazing and in the kind of responsibility they gave you early. But it was, it, it was a forerunner because it was a documentary division totally devoid of a moral ethical center. <laughs> and I think, it, I, I think, I think we were all forerunners of a, of a movement by being part of it. You know, I, 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 I came out here to work for Walper and, um, and, and uh, I, remember, I remember just because I'm, I'm, I'm not highly skilled at, at certain, you know, at certain, at certain hand-eye stuff. Um, and, but editing, manually editing 16 millimeter film, you are doing a sketch because it coils on you and you're always being covered with film. And I was started out as, you know, doing film research on, you know, on, on uh, vintage stuff. And great work took place. I mean, exciting documentaries and early documentaries. And, the, and Walper was the first person to, to, to take any step on the stage that, you know, that didn't include the networks and the first person to put together what was a syndication. I mean, he was, you know, you know, a very, you know, avant-garde man. And, and, and uh, but I, I, they had to let me go because of a, a, a rollback. Uh, I had, we had nothing. I was, I was a young married guy and we had, and we had nothing and, and it was very scary. And uh, somebody, you know, Alan Landsberg was good enough to give me a job as money was running out for a short period of term, because <laughs> Walter, because <laughs> the Walter organization had been hired by General Motors to do a documentary proving that cars were safe in the wake of Ralph Nader's. <laughs> you got a free Corvette. They, they no. flew us first class to Detroit and and, and actually didn't try to get this on NBC. This was General Motors after all. I mean, you know, we were at board meetings, and I remember I was at a board meeting with 30 people, and they played liar's poker with dollar bills so that if you, if you, uh, if you took the ultimate challenge, you owed everybody else a dollar, you know. And all I'm trying to do is not be in that position because I didn't have that much money in my pocket, and I didn't have the guile to suddenly say, oh, gee, I'm sorry, I'll, you know. I, and so, so I remember that as one of the most nervous gambling things that I've ever done in my life, and I like to gamble. 
And, they, and we were there to prove that highways were causing fatalities, <laughs> bad drivers were causing fatalities. <laughs> and they actually, you know, they actually worked hard to get a network to carry it, which of course no network would at the time. I was just thinking of the governor of New Jersey yesterday, you know, he got in a car yes. accident, he's in the hospital. But I was also thinking about Katie Couric, and maybe we'll come back to it at Broadcast News, and this, that she read this piece, did you hear this, from, that turned out to be plagiarized from the yes, Wall Street Journal? Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, you know, it just it sort of echoed uh, certain vibrations from Broadcast News that were felt uh, rather remarkable. I think Network was the prescient piece in, the, in this area, uh, you know, not my, not my picture. And it was, it was an area that I worked in, an area I, I felt strongly about. I, 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 it was a privilege to go back and research it when I'd been away from it for a while. It was a time of the great layoffs. I was there, I witnessed it, I talked to the people. I, you know, I, and, but, but the real hunt as I did that research was um, we had been through a whole time of feminist heroines, and so that enough already, you know, for that, for that kind of heroine. And I, and, I, and, I, and I knew that a heroine existed that hadn't been done yet, and I really tried, you know, to find her. And, that's, and, 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 and I was very lucky, I think, to be able to get to know a couple of women who were the raw material for that heroine. And, um, and, and more than lucky, I mean, if we talk about this, you know, more than lucky two days before we started to get the, the, the actress to play it. The role of women in your movies is, is uh, not, you know, insubstantial. Well, not even, even starting on television as well. I mean, it's pretty, they're pretty central to you know, a number, most of the films, you know, and maybe all of them almost. I mean, it's, yeah, it's pretty. I, I, yeah, I, well, I, you know, I was raised by two women. My father was, you know, as I say, is a sort of errant. And um, so I, and I had, and my mother had two sisters. And, and so I think I was around that a lot. And, um, and I remember when, 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 we, when we did the television series Taxi, it was, let's do some men. <laughs> you know, <I> was gonna... <laughs> <laughs> and when did you, sort of the crossover from, in a sense, these documentaries to actually becoming a writer or actually getting a job as a writer? What, what? Um, the, after that General Motors job, I was out of work for, and my wife was supporting us with um, an office job. And, uh, and I had no prospects. I tried to get a news writing job and I wasn't able to. And, um, and I, I had these days where, I, where I'd drop her off at work and then either go up the coast and read or go to the courts and just sit and, and watch trials because I had this time to kill. I, you know, I, I dream of being a playwright, but, you know, and, right. and did that, you know, so, um, and had gotten, you know, I had done news writing and had gotten some encouragement there, but I'd gotten no encouragement for anything else. I'd gotten a, a great letter of rejection from a magazine for a short story and, you know, where they, they said nice things to me and that was, you know, my, my uh, so I was writing. What was the magazine? Um, I don't know. It was, I think it was a now defunct magazine, right. but that was, was short stories and and uh, but was wide circulation. I mean, very widely read. I'm trying to remember the name. In this spot, I I w went to a party with a friend of mine from the, the Walper place, and I met Alan Burns. And it was New Year's Eve. It was a New Year's Eve party, and uh, and Alan Burns had left a very fancy place because he was a very successful television writer, I think, had already created two shows, maybe three. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he and his beautiful wife, who they're still beautiful, beautiful. couple, yep. um, uh, walked in in formal clothes. And we were, and they said, you know, at last real people because they had been in some fancy thing. And I met him. And he, you know, Alan is, a great human being. I mean, he's you the know nicest uh, man on the face. I of the mean, earth, he's you know yeah. pillar of the community. That's yeah. his, that's you know, and he's and just a good you know deeply good guy, deeply good guy. He was doing a show called My Mother the Car that he had created at the time, <laughs> and he he got me some kind of foot in the door where I I I did a story outline and they. I think they liked the outline if I call because correctly. Because you would talk to him at this New Year's he Eve party. Yeah, he said you can call so-and-so and call Dave Davis and, you know, later turned out to be so central right, to some right, of the shows we right. did and, you know, put us together. And, and there was a time when 
I, you know, I'm trying to remember the order it happened in, where Dave said, you know, you know there was a guy named Lorenzo Music yeah, who was sure. also funny, and he said, let's do a comedy album, because comedy albums were happening, so we did an album about Adam and Eve that, because of my sister, God bless her, we actually got to somebody important, uh, but they didn't take it, and, and it was just like very, you know, f you know, life on the fringe. They hired me to do a rewrite, um, and I think I wrote an episode, I don't know in which order, and they, and the guy who did that show liked me, and then the show got canceled, but I had had two credits, and I got an agent, and, uh, and then I got a, ch a ch uh, then I, then I got some jobs. And there was like, there was an Andy Griffith show maybe, or a That I did Girl, one, or? I did one, I did, I did, I did two That Girls. I had, a, I had a, like a season and a half of freelancing. I, I was a story editor on a, on a series that didn't last very long, that was an hour long mystery show when I didn't know how to do mystery. They were great to me. I mean, good people, just great, great good people. And I didn't know quite how to do that. I'd have ideas that had runs of dialogue, but plotting it was beyond me. Out of those freelance jobs, and it was a very dramatic improvement in my lot. I mean, you know, the, the, the story editor's job, I mean, I was, you know, really making a fine living at that point, which was sort of remarkable at, at writing. Right. And it seemed like it would go away in a second for a long time. But I got a chance to do a pilot um, based on the scripts I had done, and that was Room 222, and that sort of, you know, changed. Well, it. let's talk about 222, which is now hard to find. Now, that was done at Fox, right? So that would lead us probably to Grant Tinker at some point. Was um, he involved in it or anyway, or did he know about it, or was that a little later? Yes, that must have been, that, yes, that's absolutely how it happened. Um, and Room 222 was uh, a one-camera show, and it was the s second show in the history of television, missing first by a few months to, to star African Americans. It was, you know, and it was... Um, Lloyd Haynes and... Denise Nicholas, right, Karen right, Valentine, right. Michael yep, Constantine. Yep. yep. And, uh, and to, uh, to the Emmys, uh, you know, long shame, it, it, it beat Sesame Street for an Emmy for Best New Show. And uh, <laughs> that's, that was exactly the time. <laughs> and... Um, Big Bird still talks about that. <laughs> And it was and it was great because Gene Reynolds was the producer director, and he later later worked with me again, and later did Mash, just uh, ferociously um, uh, dedicated man who insisted and got me started on research. I had never done research, and he kept on sending me back to the high school I was researching again and again and again, and uh, and then suddenly, if you go back often enough, you find your pilot story and something somebody says. And we did, and then fought the fight for the pilot episode because you know you you you, you know the idea of, of a black guy helping a black kid in the pilot episode. You know they said make it a white kid, so we'll let. And you know Gene fought that fight, and you know, and I you know. So he, he was involved before the script was written. Yes, with the he, idea. He or hired I, me to write he, the script as right. the produ as a producer writer. He was a very prominent, very prominent director, and uh, and he was producing. This. At one time, I know he had. I don't think a pilot he had made didn't get on the air. I mean, it was like a, a very good track record. No, he was, he was, and he was, you know, he just made you dig. He just, you know, he was the person who does what you hope somebody does to you if you're a writer. I mean, he just made you dig, just made you go back, just made you make it better. And, uh, and the show... And uh, a good guy, at least. I, he did a pilot oh, that I wrote. It oh, was, oh, again, man. it got on the yeah, air, and he was... Uh, 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 another pillar of the community. Yeah. I mean, as, as <laughs> a, you know, as, as flotsam of the community, I was meeting a lot of pillars of the community, yes. And where was the high school that you kept coming back to? L.A. High. So we're now out here. You've now... Yes, 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 yes. We've been out here for the Walper days and stuff like that, yeah. So the move to... California came because of Walper or became because? Alan Landsberg, who had worked with me at a radio station, you know, after my news writing job, where I did some writing for a radio station, he had been my boss. He came out here and he was quite prominent at Walper and he sent for me. I had worked for him before uh, the news job and at this point I was, a, I was a Writers Guild news writer. I had a union job where I was making a real living and I was scared that I never would I, I, at the time. So the idea of me chucking that with its security for California was not 
an aspect of my personality. <laughs> I, was, I was not that courageous. I, I was scared. I was scared of a lot of things. And, uh, and my wife gave us the courage and then supported us. So it's one of those stories where I just owe her a great deal. Talk a little about Room 222 in terms of the impact it had and the other writers you worked with on the show. And it lasted how long? About five years, yeah. Um, and got these awards and, you know, a few more and never a smash, but well enough, doing well enough in the ratings. Was it on ABC? Uh, it was on ABC when ABC was, was you know, yeah. struggling very, right. very right. much the third network. And um, Gene was great. Alan Burns came on because he liked the show and ended up producing a good many of them. I wasn't producing, I was story editor and, you know, and Alan was my good friend and, you know, and we brought in Treva Silverman, who I knew from New York, who was a very, you know, just an enormously cool, witty woman, you know, Broadway and, you know, just really trained, really at all the great sketch shows, all the great clubs in New York, you know, just did the monkeys out here, did the, you know, she was just, she was just somebody I really looked up to, and she came in and, you know, and, and um, did part of that. We had, and it was a, a writer's shop, basically, because, you know, Jean had a great fondness for it, understood it, and, and so that there were, you know, so that it was like working on a wonderful whatever in a, in a, in a company. I, and again, as I look back with you, knowing what my personality was and what my, you know, there's got to be a better word than neurosis was, um, at the time, uh, I couldn't believe that I walked from that job, but I did. I, after a year, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't even know what I did. And about that time, Alan, uh, Grant Tinker came over to Alan and I, and his wife, Mary Tyler Moore, had an on-the-air commitment, and he asked us if we wanted to do it. And he had to be in hiding because he was working for 20th Century Fox and couldn't, and couldn't be the key person in this. So the two of us who Alan had produced some room 222s I had never produced, we had to hire the accountants. We just started from scratch. There was an office, there was an on-the-air commitment, and just people walked in and in a very giddy way, you know, that blessing you get when you don't know anything, when you're ignorant, what a great pass it is. And we, you know, we, you know, just now as these, you know, what passes for a legendary story, uh, you know, that we, we went into CBS and pitched our first idea and they said thank you and asked us to step outside and told Grant to fire us and he refused to fire us. Why, I don't know. Maybe it was room 222 because our idea was not very good and, and, um, and you know. How quickly did you know that that's what they asked him? I mean, he, did, he didn't come out and say it. Sometime what? later, sometime yeah. later. But, but the meeting had not been a honey because right, I, think, right. I, think, I think there are three things you don't want, men with mustaches, Jews, and I forget what, they, what the third thing was. <laughs> now, was that when you and divorced women, and we had, had, right. we had all three in our idea. That was right. And we went to work on another idea, and, uh, and that idea was the one that turned out to be the show. I, it's funny, I was just downstairs in the library because they were showing me my stuff here. Um, and they had uh, two Mary Tyler Moore scripts, and the first one was, the f our, our, our first draft was twice as long as the shooting script needed to be, so we were double the length that, that we had to be, and they have a copy of that script down there. Um, and, we, and we did a run-through on a Tuesday. We spent a long time casting. A blessed woman, Ethel Wine, had helped us cast. You know, that's, you know, I guess that's, I guess you don't call that luck because we stayed out a long time. But and you, wasn't she like an executive at CBS, but also cast it, which is not usual? Yeah, you know, yeah, there? yeah. She was and she she the the she was very fond of the script, and people liked the script, and um, and we cast our show with Ethel's great help. But even the casting wasn't exactly a walk in the park, right? Probably. We just yes, added a long. We were added a long time, yeah. and we did it in a in a good way, and we were. You know, I, I, I think I wrote a piece about the end of the Mary Tyler Moore show once where I told a true story about we were so nice because of Alan, because it was nice, I, you know, and we sat in the same, so that when an actor didn't do well, Alan felt necessary to, to just have long hum, humanistic conversations with him after he had clearly not done well. Maybe. And I, 
<laughs> and, and I swear to God, there was one person, because we, we had a big window that, that, that was on the ground floor who went out the window to get away from us. <laughs> so anyway, should we get to Black Tuesday? I mean, because... <laughs> <laughs> We were over. <laughs> we were over at what they called, I think, the Desi Luke Coenga Studios, which was a very small studio, but it was the stage on which Lucille Ball had done her shows. And Alan and I had Desi's Cottage. <laughs> I mean, this is our shows, I, which was as good as you'd want Desi's Cottage. <laughs> so we were, we were, we were high on the hog at that point. And um, we were going to have a run through on a Tuesday night for a show that we do that Friday. And we decided we do the warm up. I'm, you know, I'm not good at this. And, and so what started is we, we went out and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, there's a famous Jackie Gleason thing when he's on television and he can't talk. And this fully happened to me. It's, and, and, and Alan who's not great at it either, but who is, is going to accept his responsibilities <laughs> and see them through. Uh, he had the microphone and he said a few things which there was no reaction. And with no exaggeration, he turned the mic to me. And I, I was frozen at the wheel. I, I could not utter words, let alone the idea that you try and fashion them into sentences that might at some point have some humorous slant on anything was, you know, was well, well beyond me. And uh, the show took forever. It was an absolute, as disastrous as these things can be. And uh, it was uh, shattering. Now again, I was, I was the beneficiary of being with Alan Burns, who is, who is what men should be. <laughs> <laughs> and he was my partner, thank God. And, um, and we, we went back and suddenly there were, there were like 20 people in our, in our office with the Doomsday thing and Grant Tinker. And, um, and one of them, there was a guy named Andy Williams who was a hugely popular singer at the time who had his own television show. And I look around in my gloom and I thought he was sitting there too. And I couldn't figure out what a big television star we never met. And it turns out his brother was one of the managers of somebody that <laughs> looked exactly they look like yeah. him. So that was my only point of non-suicidal point. Jesus, look who's here, you know. <laughs> and I remember not wanting them to leave because if they left, we had to fully face it. And Alan, suddenly I heard Alan saying, well, I think the best thing for you to do is to, to leave Jim and I alone. <laughs> <laughs> to, get, <laughs> to get busy on the rewrite. Now, let, let's examine. He, this meant some stage of forgiveness towards me for what I had done with the microphone and this kind of work ethic that was, you know, but, and we didn't, we were long and we knew we had a cut and we knew we were very long. And then in that doomsday meeting, our script supervisor, Marge Mullen, said, you know, maybe they don't know they're allowed to laugh at Rhoda. Maybe just they think she's a pushy, aggressive person who's pushing the girl they like around. Why don't you have the kid say she likes Rhoda? Okay, I've been at this a while. Nobody has ever given me a better note. <laughs> Nobody. I mean, it was just a miracle note, you know, and, and, and it was not elegant. Gee, I like Rhoda. She's fun. I mean, it was some version of that line. There was no, there was no subtlety. So we, we cut. We used that line. Um, and that's, I think that's basically what we did. We polished some jokes, and the show went. Now, I have some spies. And wasn't there some other factors about that Tuesday, too, like... The air conditioning, was that the air conditioning? Yeah, but I mean, it's traditional. You, yeah, you know, okay. it's always too hot. You always blame the warm-up guy. I mean, it's just, you know, <laughs> the, it, and if this was the first time we knew to do that, but, <laughs> 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 but I, 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 all that was true, but it was, um, it was night and day. It was night and day. It was, it was um, suicide and celebration. It was, you know, the, you couldn't have a more different experience. So it was, um, and Alan and I had had, had had a, a thing that happened at the table read because there was an outside actor 
and I'm trying to remember what day it happened, whether it happened after Disastrous Tuesday when we had the new pages or before that. But he, um, and it was a very important moment in my life because he, he took, we walked in as he took the script and threw it. Must have been the rewrite or something like that in front of our cast that we would be spending the next seven years with, although we didn't know it at the time. And Alan, you know, this, this model citizen is also a big guy. And we, we, we both went out of body at the same time. And it's amazing that we were on the same track because we, you know, we were very different. And, but both of us, like a shot, seeing our script tossed like that, really faced this guy down with, with you, know, as, you know, on the edge of, you know, it was a physical confrontation. And he apologized, flushed, apologized. And the cast saw us do that. So, you know, we were like, <laughs> I, I, men have been getting women with stuff like that forever. So we had that, you know. Um, so it was a very fortuitous thing for us to see ourselves care that much and for us to see how we regarded the script. And, you know, and it, was, it, it was a great beginning. And he was a guest star, not a regular. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well cast is the villain of the piece that, in that episode. Tell me a little, and it can be about Mary Tyler Moore, it can be about Taxi or any of the shows, it's sort of um, some of your interactions with, I guess they're called the network. Um, you know, because I know that uh, it isn't always uh, peaches and cream. So there's Well, I think compared to where, the way it is now, it was peaches and cream, though we sort of didn't experience it that way at the time, but it's getting to be, you know, a, you know, a real blood sport. The, the number of people who can give you basic notes has just increased enormously. But, you know, I, you know this, the seminal thing, like we say, I remember I started with Gene Reynolds who really won a network battle in terms of my pilot episode. And that was, you know, I had that experience. And then, um, and then with CBS, a man had stopped us from being fired by, you know, really standing behind us. And I walked into um, our office you know, let's see, we hadn't, we had done our pilot and we were, and we were in the process of making shows. We hadn't been on the air yet. And our third show in, we were going to do, um, God, I remember the name of the episode, Support Your Local Mother. And it was about Rhoda Morgenstern and her mother. And Alan was on the phone. Uh, and I, look how great Alan is. Alan comes up in these stories again and again because mm -hmm. he's talking to the vice president in charge of us. And, uh, and the guy is telling us that our story outline is awful and that we shouldn't make the show. And he was, you know, very strong about doing that. And, um, and we thought it was a good show. And, and Alan said, well, think about what you said. And by the way, you insulted my wife the other night. I forget what he had done to Joni, some aside and stuff like that. So Alan turned the tables on the guy immediately and Grant Tinker backed us up and we did the show. And it was, you know, I think it won an Emmy. And, and, uh, and it was, you know, it was a terrific show that had been called into question. And then when we were on the air and we got a rating, and we were very lucky to follow an enormously successful show and get a, hold enough to give us a rating, they, they, we didn't have to send in story outlines anymore. And that was the thing in television. If you became, you know, when you have success, everybody goes away and you get creative freedom. In that moment before you achieve success or, or if you have to change something, then, then the world comes in. Wasn't Mary Tyler Moore originally supposed to be, we're back to Tuesday or something, and, and then oh, it was oh, moved? Oh, that's uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite good. It's, oh, God, I sh yes, there, there's nothing archival that should go without this being mentioned. This sounds like a science fiction story. Absolutely true. The CBS network had, at the time, had 18 of the top 20 shows, something crazy. You know, all of the top 10 shows, and there were shows like at the time, I think Beverly Hillbillies and Petticoat Junction, they were sort of bucolic shows. And, uh, and we were relegated to a time period where we, where we could not have succeeded. And that's something that's happened to me a few times. I think everybody in television, it's the most insidious thing where you don't get the opportunities to succeed. Um, and, and there's a guy named Bob Wood who took over as president of the network and thought all these shows that had these unparalleled ratings, because they'll never be equaled again, so these are historic ratings, uh, he canceled them because he thought they weren't good enough. And he just did it for, in the pursuit of quality. 
I mean, I think these shows are rather good when we look back at them, by the way. They're fun shows. I, you know, I think much too harsh, and some of them are just, have, some of them have lived forever. You know, Beverly Hillbillies has lived forever, you know, so, but he, there were a lot of them. There were a lot of shows like that. And, um, and he put us on and, and then gave us a time period where we'd be seen, gave us our shot. Talk a little about Grant Tinker. Oh, it's, well, this is, um, this is what the Protestant gene pool is, pro <laughs> produces at its most ideal. I mean, I mean, this is in the crosshairs when all those things kiss each other. Chromosomes and, are and, yes, aligning. And, and, yeah. and produce the, the perfect man. I mean, he was, uh, you know, uh, in terms of um, great looking, bright, witty, superb athlete, uh, gent, you know, just ethics, honor, uh, above profit, you know, he was that guy. And, and the perfect story is that as with the success of MTM, which is the company he founded and became a very enormously successful production company with a lot of hit television shows, a couple of which, you know, Alan and I had done and some others had done, uh, it be started to be too big and we started to lose that little thing I talked about earlier, two guys in all their ignorance and and four of us, Alan did not want to do it, four of us got together and uh, left and took what we had going and, and went and formed a little company and, you know, to do other television shows. We went to Paramount. We went right. to Paramount. And, uh, and it, you know, it's in the same sense as I tell these part of the stories, it's amazing to say that I did that because when, you know, the... I, walking off a pier or taking t that kind of dramatic step in my life voluntarily doesn't go with the me I know, but clearly it happened, and I did it. And, uh, and then we were trying to figure out what we do for our first series. And we had read a magazine article when we were at MTM and thought it might make a series, and Grant had purchased the magazine article for us, and we wanted to do it, and we called him up, and the people who had left him, you know, and, uh, and he gave it to us, and that was Taxi. Taxi was the great time. Uh, it, it was a good time. It was a, a sort of blue-collar show done with all of us being blue-collar people. Right, and, and, right. And, uh, and we, Paramount at the time was very prominent in television and, you know, and Ron Howard was doing a show down the block, and, and uh, Penny Marshall was doing a show down the block. Tom Hanks was starring in a series. Uh, Robin Williams was starring in a series. And it was, and, and we, and we were, and we, there was also an absolute, absolute wall between television and movies. If you worked in television, you did not get an opportunity in movies. It was just absolute. A few, a few people had slipped over, mostly actors, you know, or, you know, but, but certainly, you know, not comedy writers, not, right. not, not, you know, not, not generally actors at that point. It was the kiss of death. It was just, we, so aside from good salaries and creative freedom, we even got to be a ghetto. You know, we got to be, to feel underprivileged. So, you, so, so, you know, that's the trifecta. You know, we, we just had that going for us and we enjoyed it so much. And it was, uh, you know, for, for an aspect of it, it was also the drug days, which colored lives around us a little bit. And, um, and, and, we, and we loved our show. We, our cast was unique. I mean, we had, we had uh, Danny DeVito, who's magic and individual, and, you know, just a very serious actor. Judd Hirsch, who's one of the best actors of his generation. Uh, we had Andy Kaufman, who originated performance art, who was just a, a, an absolute original. Carol Kane, who'd been nominated for an Academy Award. Mary Lou Henner, who was fresh from Greece on Broadway. I never had got so much out of 24 hours of research in my life, and I said that Gene Reynolds research, because we went to the taxi com uh, company where the article was based, and that was supposed to be where everybody had an ambition to be something else. And how do you, so two things happened in that 24 hours. We saw the very short taxi dispatcher 
being given a bribe for a ca cab and running order, <clears throat> because we were there, and I saw it, and that became Louis de Palma's character, because I just saw that, that money take hands, and I saw right. the dispatcher try and get rid of him. And we saw that the would-be everythings who were there were waiting for one charismatic driver to have breakfast with at the end of a 12-hour shift, and we waited with him. And when we talked to him about his ambition, he says, me, I'm a cab driver. And that became the core of what defined Judge, Judge Hirsch's heroism. And I don't know how we would have done the series without either of those things happening, which happened in front of us, you know, in that 24 hours to be scooped up. So two things to follow up on. One is research, because you've now mentioned it a couple of times, whether it was Room 222, Taxi, and I suspect it's going to if when we get to things like Terms of Endearment. It it's going to be, a, yeah, yeah. So Gene, the Gene Reynolds lesson has, has uh, you know, become just regular, regular life for me. And the other is we. We went to, for 20 hours, who is the we, which gets me to working with writers, working with the other writers, and how you do uh, Stan and did Daniels, that. Ed Weinberger, Dave Davis, and myself. For that, that's the we of that. And it, whether it's on Mary Tyler Moore or Taxi, is sort of what and was... And well, the Charles brothers who later went on to right, Cheers, et cetera, right. they, they, were, they were part of that early group, you know. And uh, Sam Simon, who later, uh, you know, worked on uh, creating The Simpsons with myself and, and uh, Matt, uh, he was part of that, that, that taxi group. And, and David Lloyd was around somewhere. David right? Lloyd was always oh, around. David always Lloyd around was around somewhere. Always Still around, always somewhere. Around, always, around, yeah. always around. Always around. Always funny. And has given off progeny, too. Um, yeah. But... As well as that, sort of the process that how you work. Let's, I mean, I think of one of the first shows I think I was aware of of the caliber of writing was the Mary Tyler Moore show, and that though it was all there was you know music to it that was similar, I could feel differences within the episodes of maybe who wrote them. The Trevis Silverman episodes, as I remember, were had a polish and distinct. Uh, very good here, yeah. Um, yeah. And we're sort of uh, at a different kind of luminosity or something. And when you got maybe to Rota. I think that's true of David Lloyd as well. Yeah. And which was it Charlotte Brown or someone in Rota? There was mm -hmm. some flavor. It wasn't, it was a different flavor. It was yes, more I like know. in the. Very, 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 um, very well observed. But how sort of did you, you all, whether it was you and Alan or, you know, moving to Taxi, did you all work with each other or with the writers? 90% of the stories came from myself and Alan. I mean, you know, and, you know, the pitching sessions, you'd go away with a lot. You'd go away with, you know, almost your outline, key jokes, and, you know, that's when we'd pitch it out, and then with Ed and Stan later on. And, um, and then you'd have, you, you'd get a script, and um, you'd have a rewrite, or if it was, if it was terrible, you'd take it over right at that point, you know, and there were a lot of page one, there were a lot of page one rewrites, a lot of them, you know, where you just, went back to the story that you pitched and 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 it was and that before you got to the table read now we're still ahead before of the, the table read yeah. yeah and and you know we uh, we had a rule original writer no matter what always got credit nobody else tried to share his credit or anything else and that was you know that that prevented you know capricious rewrites of a certain sort we'd have a table read and w you'd have good ones or bad ones, and uh, no network present in those days. Right, no right. network present. I mean, I, you know, it's just, it just makes my heart stop to think of that because you know, the thing you want to do is you have to say it's a time is of such essence. So you you you've got to go back and say what went wrong here and make that call and stuff like that. And you'd begin rewriting. And on some weeks you'd end up rewriting most of the show. That would be a very rough week. That would be very late hours. But on Tuesday, the director would give you a rough run through. And Tuesday was very important because this is a multi-camera shows. You'd sit there in, you know, long rows of chairs with writers and everybody who, you know, I mean, you couldn't see who was at the other ends of these rows of chairs. And you'd run through and you'd move your chairs to the next set and you'd run through the set. And, and there, what our job was, Alan's and, and mine and, and, and then Ed and Stan's uh, as well, as a way is to what's what's not working is it the acting is it the staging is it the script and you always have to be willing to hit the script yourself and that stop anybody else from hitting the script you know somebody have trouble with a line maybe I don't understand this joke you do that but basically is we're policing ourselves so much you don't have to you know we're, we you know we're and that's and we'd be on the stage to sometimes we'd fool around with it and make it work without changing the script which is where you know where you 
you start to learn to direct, I guess, in a certain way. And, uh, and then you go back and you, you do another rewrite. Now it would be Wednesday. If you're still rewriting on Thursday, you're really in trouble because that's camera blocking days and it's exhausting days for the cast. And, and then on Friday, you go there for a run through just before the audience comes in. And, um, and you can always tell to me a show that really has a great vibe when somebody says actors to the rail because the cameras are in front of us so we're all crowded in the bleachers where the audience will come in. And when the cast wants to come there to hear your notes, you know that people have a great working environment. And, and that was true on Mary, that was true on Taxi. Where they, you know, and then and and the fun is throwing in a joke at the last minute, run it again. That part's not running. They're getting made up. You go back, you go, you know, you go, you go backstage, and they're and they're being made up, and you pull actors in, and you say, you know, try it this way, try it that, you know, and so so the energy starts to build, and then you do your show. In the case of these both ensemble acting comedies, if you will, and also ensemble writing groups. Was it everybody pitching in, or was certain people have certain flavors, or you know, almost certain roles within? Well, we that? had, you know, the Bob Ellison, you know, would, uh, you know, he'd be. Sometimes you have people coming there just to pop jokes and stuff like that. Sometimes things would get laughs in the room, or you know, just their room laughs. They're for that room at that time, and they're not going to work. And if there was a particular, what would be sort of the Jim Brooks most often note, or know. most often? I don't know. I think I, I, I think I was. I, I mean. I, I, I would rattle a lot. I would, I would, you know, I would, uh, you know, I, I could, you know, I'd hit a run and a rewrite, and you know, and then and, and it would be, you know, it's, it, I'd be pissed off if they if somebody didn't get it down because I'd just done a page and I, you know, it was in that environment that would happen to me, and uh, and then there, you know, and and because the words are so important, which word comes this and which word comes, you know, you know, just, and, and well, I'll tell you, it's one of the great. Th Here's, here's, here's the great rewrite story. Um, we had a show where these characters, Rhoder and Phyllis, one earthy and one very outre, you know, had a, loathed each other. And they, were bo they both had Mary Tyler Moore as a friend in common. So their rivalry and their, and, 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 um, and Phyllis's brother met Rhoda. And they started really enjoying each other and seeing each other. And we had a guy named Bob Moore, famous director of Neil Simon Comedies on Broadway, who later directed my first full-length piece as the actor who played the brother. And we had no ending, and it wasn't working. And then we had a great idea in rewrite that the brother was gay, which had never occurred to us. This is late in the week. And the joke was, and this was the first announced gay character in television history, I think. I don't know whether soap had been on yet, I, you know, but this was, you know, this was, and the joke was, um, I'm not going to get involved with Rhoda, I'm not going to get involved with Rhoda. Why aren't you going to get, I, I, I think you are, no, I'm not. Phyllis, her brother, said, I'm gay, and, 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 she, and she said, oh, what a relief, which was a big, which was a big laugh at the time. And, uh, and we had to call Bob, because it was so, so racy and such a, such a, Cheeky thing to do at the time, and call Bob Bob Moore and say, "Is it okay? Right, do you right, mind yeah. saying? You know, that's how it was. I yeah, mean, this yeah, was yeah. this was um, if it wasn't television history, it was a cousin of television history. This line, and that was you know, and that's how you have a half hour show. And Grant Tinker used to have a great line because he said, "If you fly, if you realize if you fly from uh, New York to Los Angeles on a Saturday night and jump out of the plane, you'll very likely land on somebody watching your show." It was a, it's you know, it's a great. You know, sense of what it is, and um, it's it's always a television comedy show that's working is the best job in the world. That's it. There's no better job, especially at that stage of life, where you have community, where people have security, where people have friendship, where you get to you know, it's putting out your own news. Day. It's just where it's it you know, it's the great job. And I think even though a lot has gone bad all around us, it's still the best job. In, um, in show business. And let me ask you, as you're doing the sort of run-up or the riff toward uh, I'm gay or he's gay, it almost felt like the end of Some Like It Hot. And, and you know, where you get to eventually, you know, I can't marry you because I can't. Well, you don't make it. up this stuff. No, no, but I'm just, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Were there, we, we, I don't think we were very specific about, were there movies 
you mentioned plays or comedies, you know, and you mentioned Chayefsky, but other things that that were back there, not not to, you know, just as flavors that. Well, that, you mean, there, there was seminal. You know, I remember the group I was with. It included, you know, Albert Brooks and Penny and who I was with when we saw Annie Hall when we right. had a screening of right. Annie Hall, and and the Earth changed, yeah. the planet changed, our lives changed. You know, it was. It's amazing that, you know, graduate, you have seminal works that, you know, just, you know, just, it's, it, you cannot exaggerate it. It's, it's, you know, the, the pillars of the bridge that are, you know, going to save us all.